Okay, so we will start the show in five, four, <laughs> three, why did I start at five? Three, two, one. On question number one, how much you need to start up a KFC? Hey everyone, it's Thursday, November 20, or December something. What is it? It's December 14th, and my name is Bobby Frankenberger. You're listening to episode 32 of the Sixth World Podcast. Executive producer for today's episode is James O'Neill. Thank you for supporting the show. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Cassie Levitt. How's it going, Cassie? I'm good, hello, hello. Did you uh, you heard the stinger this time? You heard that throwback? That was like episode one, I think. We talked about that weird KFC training lady. I don't even remember that. Nope. <laughs> Not had a bit. Yeah. Well, that's that's what it was. That's what it was. Okay. <laughs> um, today our guest is sh- for the first time. We uh, we often have repeat per- people, but for the first time uh, we have Shadowrun freelancer Brooke. Chang, welcome to the show, Brooke. Thanks, Bobby. Glad to be here. Yes, we're very happy to have you. I am, little inside note, every time I mention someone that I need to get for something, I swear our good friend, uh, Opti, Chad, always uh, floats your name out there. I think he's, for some reason, been dying to get you on the show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I probably owe him something for that then. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, I just got a message from Opti one morning. I was going to ask him about something else. And I wake up, and the first thing I see is, hey, want to be on the Sixth World Podcast? (laughs) Uh, Sure, I'd love to. What a what a guy! He's he's a he's hooking things up for people and getting us Mm. guests. Um, But uh, we're really excited to have you on the show, Uh, Brooke. Um, tell us a little bit about, since, since you're new, and I happen to know from talking to you, they have a little bit of a story to go into about it, but tell us, how did you, when and how did you get into Shadowrun? I got into Shadowrun, um, originally through a campaign that never really materialized, it was probably five or six years ago now, um, and the... The quick version of that, since I'm going to go into more detail in a minute, um, <laughs> was that I started, I actually started as a proofreader for CGL in late 2012, early 2013, um, and my first writing credit with them was in Chrome Flash, um, and it was away for about a year, and for all of um, all of 2017, I've basically been doing nonstop Shadowrun. Wow. All of 27. That's pretty good. What part of Chrome Flesh were you uh, involved in? Um, I wrote the mental health sections. Um, right, right. So uh, runners, runners Field Guide to Mental Illness, uh, the PTSD portion, and um, like mental health and CFD, mental illness and CFD. That was an interesting know. part. That, from We we weren't even doing the show at the time that that came out, but uh, that... um. That was that's like grounds that uh, that Shadowrun's not really covered before, so I think that was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was Jason actually specifically requested that um, when we got the project spec for it. Um, there, he said, you know, I'm, because we've never covered this in Shadowrun before, I want when we do that, you know, like the biotech and medical section, I want someone to do mental health and PTSD. And I was like, okay, I had, like, he had just brought me on to the writing crew like two weeks before that. Right. <laughs> um, so I figured that now was as good a time as any. Mm-hmm. So, so, so to segue into, you, you tell me, and I don't know what the story is, you just told me that somehow uh, Russell, Rusty Zimmerman is involved in keeping you in Shadowrun? <laughs> and well, getting me, getting me into, uh, getting me into being involved with Shadowrun as far as I was, um, when I first started for that campaign that never happened, yeah. um, one of the books that I had started to use to build a character was, uh, Spy Games, and specifically the Tradecraft section in there, um, so I read through Spy Games and that part of the book, uh, later found Street Legends and looked at Thorne's character profile, um, then read Land of Promise um, mm-hmm. about uh, Tears Turn Gear, the fourth ed supplement, and um, 
I was, I've been like maybe like a third to a half of Shadowrun's players, like the third, the third to half that don't hate it. Um, I've been mm -hmm. pretty much into into the Elven Kingdom since I started. Right. Kingdom of Nations. Um, ooh, Earth on reference there, but. <laughs> So I got into the whole Elfy thing, I guess you could call it, and there was one day where I was posting on the Dump Shock forums, and we had a, a thread going discussing some of that, and one of the people who re replied to the thread was Rusty. And right, because he's all over forums everywhere, for real. Yeah. And the other elf guy. Yeah, and he's the <laughs> yeah. other. Of course, yeah, yeah naturally. Well, he's, he's kind of the elf guy, um, yeah. but I... So I saw his um, his little like unofficial errata for Thorn in his forum signature or something, and then I realized like okay, he's basically written all of the stuff that I'm really enjoying right. about Shadowrun right now. So I sent him I sent him a PM on the forums um, saying basically saying hey, I love your stuff. Um, right. And then we got uh, talking every so often um, here and there. I'd, I'd send him a message every few months and ask about something, um, but it was largely through. Those three titles, um, like Spy Games, Street Legends, and The Land of Promise, that I really got into Shadowrun. And then what drove me to start writing for Shadowrun was reading Neat and Shaken. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I have been... Um, I've been accused of being a Rusty Zimmerman fangirl before. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure that you know if, if I were to go on about this very much more, he would probably, like, as soon as he sees this, he's going to go, she knows I'm married, right? <laughs> <laughs> don't, but, don't, but yeah, no, just... don't worry. He loves all the attention. I, I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, so that, that's the story. It was, it was basically that, um, all of the stuff that really brought me into Shadowrun, uh, Rusty was the one who wrote it. Um, and I just... There's just something about his style that resonated really well with me. Yep. Um, it's fairly rare for me to find someone who's who I can you know read all of their stuff and actually like the vast majority of it. Um, but for me, Rusty has hit that niche. So. Yeah, we mm -hmm. love Rusty too. So you're in, you're in good company, absolutely. So um, we just love to bust his chops a little bit um, because <laughs> he deserves it. Uh, but yeah, so, um, Hair. yeah, <laughs> uh, but yes, well, it, it's uh, the, the long road has led you here, which is going to, I'll warn you now, it's going to be the, the, uh, it's, it's, it's all downhill after the sixth world podcast. Uh, ever, that's what everybody tells us. Um, so Nobody <laughs> tells us that. <laughs> no one tells us that. Right? Yeah. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, the uh, before we go in, I, I should have said this before. Um, we we have to. We did get one new patron since our last episode. Brandon, just Brandon. So thank you, Brandon. Um, and we're gonna try, I guess, in during the Q and A part again to take a call if anybody who's listening live wants to do that. You know, maybe it'll work this time. <laughs> um, but uh, we'll see. Um, I do have one little comment I wanted to read. Last episode, we we uh, we talked a bunch about um, Wendy's and how crappy their food <laughs> is, and how I realized how bad it is, um, even though I'd loved it forever. And uh, Jason Miller wrote in and said, "Bobby, I'm listening to the latest podcast and concerning Wendy's. Their chili. Come on, Bobby. The chili is great. Wendy's was my first." Uh, high school job as well, and I still love me some Wendy's chili. Love the podcast. I'd participate if I wasn't at work. Um, I actually kind of forgot about the chili, and I guess if uh, the the chili is good, although they use that like leftover meat. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, the chili is supposed to be made for like that's. Yeah, I like the chili. All right, so but I, I think it, it says something that you can actually work at that restaurant and not get sick of their food by the time you quit. Yes, that's what I did. You know, that's what so. happened. And um, I guess also, you know, I made the point that uh, that um, that uh, that you think of a food and Wendy's is never the first place you think of to go to get something. Um, but I guess like baked potatoes. Uh, no, my roommate at home, <laughs> if he was going to a fast food, that's the one he went to because he likes the chili and whatnot. Yeah, I do. I do like the chili. So I apologize, Wendy's and Wendy's fans. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> I'm a I'm a confused post Wendy's fan person, so I may have said things that I didn't mean. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're gonna go straight to, I think, straight to Q&A. There's no news, is there? Anybody have any news? Do you want to skip the news? Let's skip the news. Yeah. <laughs> um, no news, right? Because we just don't have any news. So we're gonna go to Q&A. Okay. Um, like I said, guys, if you want to uh, call in and talk to us, if you'd like, you can uh, do that by going to our Discord uh server um there's a if you go to the voice channels there's one called uh, six or there's one called live events and discussion if you just sit in there and make sure you're unmuted if i see you i will pull you in and we'll and you can ask us a question and then i'll kick you out and we'll answer the question um so do that if you want to uh we're gonna go through a couple of questions we got ahead of time first uh we get these questions uh from our email there's also a form on our website at sixthworldpodcast.com uh you can email us at the show at sixthworldpodcast.com and our patrons get priority like the first one we're gonna answer is from patron laszlo zingo I haven't heard from this guy in a while cassie we used to get questions from him constantly yeah um, haven't heard from him in a while but uh he's back and he says, uh, Bobby and Cassie, I have another, I have a question uh, for you guys. It's about the adept power, killing hands and astral combat. The last sentence of killing hands says, quote, your killing hands attacks are magical, so they can bypass a creature's magical defenses against attack, uh, such as the immunity to normal weapons power and may be used by adepts with the astral perception, with astral perception during astral combat, end quote. Number one, his question, number one, are there other, quote, magical defenses against attack? Uh, that uh, besides immunity to normal weapons that killing hands bypasses he has more but i'm going to stop because i i know you have we should address the no, part one first <laughs> yeah i agree with him one of the ones he mentioned i can think of off the top of my head is re normal regeneration that normally you know, magic damage cannot be regenerated so i would argue that it applies to that uh, again it's gonna be gm discretion because it's a pretty open statement i always uh, thought mentioned... regenerate so re magic damage so regeneration doesn't work against magic damage is what you're saying the the normal regeneration was there's one added i think in dark terror is actually that for the shadim anyway so there's potentially a buffed up one but the standard regeneration cannot regenerate magic damage right okay so, i didn't know that actually so, okay arguably i would i would say killing hands probably would apply to that because you're infusing your hands with mana and stuff like that but it, that would be gm discretion i suppose uh, another one he mentioned was Mystic Armor. I, I wouldn't say it applies to that one because Mystical Armor is kind of intended to help with astral defense. So, right. Yeah, uh, but like, I, would... I think anything that, um, anything, well, like Cassie said, that's actually intended to block magical effects, so like Mystic Armor or, well, maybe not Mana Barriers, but, um, yeah, yeah mis of... Mystic Armor and stuff like that, I, I don't think Killing Hands would bypass that. Another one I can think of, though, that might but it would be up to the GM would be potentially a Mana Blade, because Mana Blades can only be blocked by, like, weapon foci, active weapon foci, and things like that. Mm. You're killing hands, again, being magical. It seems a little weird to me that you're using <laughs> your magical fist to block a knife, but people do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, so. it works for, you know, mundane blades, right? Why not? Yeah, so Everything's I would, better with magic. Normally they can't be blocked, <laughs> so I would I would say you could probably use the block ability with those, but Right. Uh, so those are the three I could then think of. Uh I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but I mean there's probably more stuff out there. Uh <laughs> or will be in the future because they sure. are always adding things. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, the second part of his question is how does killing hands help during astral combat? Um he says uh, to clarify the reason for his question, the final line, quote, may be used by adepts with astral perception during astral combat, end quote. Uh, what would that accomplish, he asks. Normal astral combat allows the combatant to choose stun or physical already. Uh, and then he says his group is considering allowing the power to let the adept use their physical attributes instead of mental during astral combat. And he's wondering what our thoughts on are that our thoughts are on that. Uh, to cover the first one, you need to understand the line that actually comes before that, and it says, Killing hands may be combined with other adept powers that increase damage. So the main thing that that is mentioning that you can use for astral combat is because then you're getting the bonus on top of that. Right, so if you have something, um, the normal unarmed base damage would be just charisma, but potentially if you have adept stuff that boasts it, it would be charisma plus that damage increase. 
I think that's what it's intended. And just to simplify, like, if someone was curious, like, do I get to use this while he's in Astral Combat? Yes. They clearly stated, yes, it's there. <laughs> right, right. I think that's the main focus of it. Um, yeah, for the second... Thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, another thing that I would add is that version of the rules was obviously, since it's... Um, I think it's from the core book. Um, yeah, but it is. It's, yeah, so that was also published before we had the optional rules from Run and Gun about using that one martial arts technique for... Oh, yeah, the... So, oh, I forget the name of it. Uh, Ninja. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that was... The rules for Killing Hands were published before we had that martial arts technique. Um, so I don't remember off the top of my head whether you would have been able to use Astral Combat... Um, with mundane weapons before that technique came out, um, but I could see it filling that gap in you until we had the running gun option. You can only do well, and even then, that wouldn't apply because it's still killing hands, so you're still using your fists mm -hmm. um, for like the mundane weapons, is why I'm mentioning it. Uh, but uh, normally, only like weapon foci essentially can be used, or you can still use your fists, which is why it's a little weird that it's in there because you can use your hands anyway. Uh <laughs> yeah, that's I. I I'm, I'm, Kind of fishing for reasons. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I don't have a, a specific answer for that one, unfortunately. But yeah. I think it's just intended to be very clear. You can use this, and then, like I said, the rule before it, or the that you can use damage increases mm -hmm. uh, if they apply to unarmed is uh, also important. So right. um, the second part of it, I never let my players use physical attributes in the astral because I have never found any reference yet of a physical body going to the astral. Um, and I know why he's thinking of probably doing that, which I'm not going to bring it up because that's a different conversation. But I'll, I'll trust I you. Would say, yeah, I would say that I, I don't think it applies for the rules. It really says astral combat is very clear. PCs use their mental stats. That said, at the end of the day, it's your group and your role. So if you want more damage on the astral and you don't want to make the adept invest in mental stats, then... Go forward to your game. Break it as you like. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, well, I hope, uh, Laszlo Zingo, I hope that uh, discussion clears it up for you. The next question we have is from Weaver, and he asks, uh, it's Weaver from, Di we got this question from Discord. It was, um, why is Matrix Perception a complex action? And I added this one because I'd never thought about it before, and it seemed to me like a worthy thing to think about. Why is Matrix Perception a complex action? I have the reason I think it's that way, but I'd be curious if Brooke has any. <laughs> um, I don't have anything off the top of my head. Um, I wasn't involved in developing those rules at all, so I don't. I, I don't have any of the, um, you know, the internal okay. rationale that we were using. Um, my guess, honestly, would be that they were just trying to make it so that as many matrix actions as possible were all complex actions, rather than dividing them up as standard actions or simple actions and free actions and so on. Yeah. Um, um, I So the wrong part is like matrix perception I don't think should be complex is because it's observant detail. A normal perception in combat is simple. Uh, but I right. hazard to guess, I have a theory of what the rationale was for it. We're entering speculation because, zone, guys. Yes, it's purely <laughs> speculation, mm -hmm. but... Uh, by default, all anyone who uses VR to do their role on a team is the fastest character on the team. Now, I'll put an asterisk to that because some people may disagree. We'll come back to it. <laughs> but, but if you're in VR, you're going to get three to four passes in a combat turn. By default, everyone else is getting maybe one or two. And so Matrix Perception being and like Sin Message and some of these other ones that probably should be a simple or even a free action, I think are complex in order to make that VR character use more combat turns to do their things in order to like so they don't dominate the combat or that scene that's my theory if that but is that's... if that were true okay. like let's assume that that's uh, that's the okay. reason cassie i think that's a really stupid reason um fair because <laughs> right because we all the know reason how you go into works. vr is so you have mm -hmm. more actions right why take those away so Right, but purely by like building a standard character and doing no different changes, the person who can be in VR can roll at least four d6s, where the other person's only running one, right? So it's a lot more actions. But, of course, naturally, I said that, and we'll go back to the asterisks. Sure. That's not how anyone plays. 
Yeah. Right? Everyone chases initiative. Everyone goes after right, dice, right. whether it's with edge or drugs or adept powers or increased reflexes. So it ends up being everyone has two to four passes and the decker is doing these kind of tedious extra actions <laughs> that kind of delay him getting to do something cool. <laughs> Um, I could also see it being for host reasons too, because you want to slow things down, so then ice have more options to do things and can challenge the decker. But I, I would homebrew matrix reception and send message and even brute force and hack on the fly to all be simple actions. <laughs> right, right. Now Tagashi Tagashi Jack says, and he he's giving me a hard time. He says this just in: Bobby thinks potential game balance is a stupid reason. Um, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. To be fair, this th the fact that it was a complex action was in there from the beginning. Like, like if they thought the fact that you have so many actions was a problem and they needed to balance it, why did they give them so many actions to begin with? Like, like I could understand if that was something that was like I don't know, errated later or in a late in a later yeah. book was if it changed. Had come in like data trails, maybe then. That, right, right, like, because because you, you know, could think of it as like like but... they're patching it, right? Um, but they weren't. So, uh, anyway. I, said, I bet somebody looked at him and were like, oh, they're always going to be rolling 4d6. I don't know. Maybe it could be completely wrong. <laughs> but uh, <Right. laughs> I, I definitely would say make it a freaking simple. There needs to be more simple matrix actions. But also keep in mind that the matrix is still really new in like the rule system, at least the matrix that we have now. So it, it hasn't gone fair. through yeah. the 30 years of fixes that uh, magic has right <laughs> right right yeah. well still still uh growing pains i guess yeah. <laughs> so uh, um but uh, those are the questions we don't have anybody who wants to talk to us so we're going to move right on into the main topic of the show because it's a whole book we want to talk about so uh here we go all right that's right you guys are listening to hear us uh, talk about dark terrors, presumably. Or maybe you're just listening to hear us talk. Uh, that'd be nice. That's nice, too. Uh, but today we're talking about dark terrors. So that's the source book that just came out. Not just came out. When did it come out? Like three weeks ago? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. About three weeks ago, yeah. Um, and boy, I was ex I have been... Uh, me and Cassie have both been actually pretty excited about this book. I we had talking to several people, get past guests in the show. Uh, we knew some things that were coming in this book, and I was really excited about them. Um, so I'm, you know, in turn really excited to talk about them. First of one I want to hit right away is the thing that I was really excited about was the Shadim or Shadim. I always have to say that pronunciation's a thing. Um, I call I say Shadim. Uh, so we're just going to move on. Um, but the Shadim uh, have been... They, this was hit on a lot in Dark Terrors. Um, uh, so when we're talking about Shadim, what exactly are we talking about, Cassie? G tell me what... Give me your a quick two-sentence description of what, what, what this thing is. Shadowrun Zombies. Shadowrun zombies. <laughs> you... I did two words. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's essentially what they're there for is so that you can have the Walking Dead come back, right? And uh, right, right. And move around. Right. Um, they've got a lot of really cool flavor to them, but that's, <laughs> that's the two words I use to describe them. Yeah. Like body There's sets, something right. on TV tropes about like our zombies are different. I don't know if that's page. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well. No, they, uh... I mean. And a good master one, they're also body snatchers. They'll take a mage's body whenever they're out flying around in the astral, so be careful where you project. <laughs> They'll steal it and walk off with it. Uh, they have, they just want to destroy the world. And they're a good bit, bit bad, right? Like, other than some of the weird stuff in Forbidden Arcana, most people are not being like, hey, let's bring them over for tea. Like, no, <laughs> uh, no one likes you. That's You're one of the evil. things. That's one of the um, things. And uh, <laughs> I wonder if you agree, Brooke, about this kind of concept is uh, one of the reasons I am so attracted to the Shadim is that, and I've said this plenty of times before, that I, I like it every once in a while when Shadowrun has just like cut and dry, black and white. These are just evil. Um, like, we can all agree that these are a bad thing. And that's what they are to me, Brooke. What do you think? Um, I completely agree. I'm actually, for someone who came to the game so recently, I tend to be a little bit conservative about that kind of thing. Right. Um, there are, I, I do think there are 
certain from a GM's perspective, I do think there are certain things that players shouldn't be allowed to play with. Um, some of the stuff that we've released rules for, I if I had been the one making the call, I probably wouldn't have, but I can right. see the value in it. Um, sure. So just from that perspective, it's nice to have stuff where i mean yeah it's you know an unambiguous enemy and also that you know the gm has a few more tricks up their sleeve um instead of being you know sending something like that out and a player being like hey cool i can do this too right um yeah so so what what did you know what did dark terrors bring that's different because we've we've known about shadim before and, and a lot of the stuff we're talking about is is already known right so uh this book um one of the things it does is talk about a little bit more about why they're here, what they're doing here, like what they're actually doing, because nobody really knows why they're here. Um, even this book doesn't really clarify anything like that. Give some sort of theories, best guesses that people have been able to come up with in the, you know, something like a little over 15 years since they've appeared in the sixth world. Um, like, you know, some people think they're they're just refugees that are that are here for some reason, fleeing at the same time that Ghost Walker came over, um, and nobody knows why they were fleeing, but they're just here. And now that they're here, they want to like enslave metahuman or kind or uh, or like siphon mana back to their meta plane. But nobody really knows why they're here, and so that's I think that's one thing I do like because it it kind of leaves that open for GMs um, to play with, you know and you can play with the motivations behind what they're what what we know they're actually doing um it appears that they're searching for a bunch of artifacts that's one thing uh, they're like collecting them um they're uh oh for example like i think one of the places they talk about they're moving on is uh where's that uh what's that mountain mount is it mount shasta yeah mount yes shasta. yeah yeah, they're moving on there because uh, what's her name? I always forget the dragon's names. Has to be. Has to be. Oh yeah, has to be. That was her lair, and she's not there right now, right? Uh, yes. I think she's. Yeah, she's exiled, right? Yeah, yeah, she's exiled. She's yeah, she's no longer living at Mount Jasta. Um, yeah, and I think. And her horde was. Uh, her horde was looted. Um, in, I think it was Stormfront that actually mentioned that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, with the whole like the end of the the Great Dragon Civil War, right? And, um, you know, the, the whole punishment with has to be being exiled. Um, there was, I think, there was a note in there about how people started going in, reading her lair, um, mm -hmm. almost immediately. Um, right. So anything, that, given that it's you know a few years later in the setting by this point, anything that people would have left in there is probably not um, something that most people would want in circulation which of course is why the shooting were going for it um whatever the gm ultimately decides that is right one of the other things that they're it's clear that they're trying to do is because they're starting to it used to be they were really uh, centralized either around dc or mostly just spread out all over the place um washington dc that is where the rift was the watergate rift where they it's presumed that they all came through there but there are some thoughts that maybe they're coming through in other places now um, but they're starting to like congregate in different places all over and it seems that those are places that are near powerful mana sites and so so it looks like they're trying to control those for what purpose who knows some people think to well, go ahead so it's it's a good to know like the history of them too and um, because like they they were they came here they were really plentiful people have been like executing them and hunting them down especially the master shadims and for several books, including Hard Targets, they played up heavily that they were just about to be wiped out. Right? Yeah, that that's a really good point. They were gone and desperate and getting away from their meta plane. And so it was this quest constantly to find out how to bring more into it. And now, by the time Forbidden Arcana gets back, they can free ride in with anybody who's willing to, any magician who wants to make a deal. And, right, uh, right. That's and a really good point. Because, um, yeah. and I forgot to, because you're talking about that, um, the motivation behind this, because the Watergate Rift, which is where they were coming through, it got closed. Ghostwalker closed it. Mm -hmm. um, and that cut them off. So, you know, like you said, they're being like picked off. And so there's this sense of panic, you know, that they're going to be wiped out. Um, yeah, their meta plot was always for a long time of essentially how do we get home or how do we get more people here essentially, and they've they've now found ways to do it between the magicians and Forbidden Arcana and there's an artifact they have in Dark Terrors that can also bring people in with a blood sacrifice. Right. 
So, so it's, it's kind of clear that that's part of what they're doing. But again, why are they trying to come here? Who knows? Why aren't they just all trying to go back? You know, time will tell, I suppose. But, um, but, uh, that's, that's a lot. They talk a lot about that in, uh, this book. There are some groups that are also trying to fight against the Shadim. Um, one of them is Hestibi, uh, for the reasons we just talked about. Um, there's another dragon, our leash. Uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, the reason our leash is involved because apparently our leash is is very interested in keeping uh powerful artifacts and everything out of people's hands and out of the wrong hands and so because these shadim seem to be looking for artifacts uh there's an interest yeah there. our, our leash is kind of like the um almost the magical police great dragon if you want to call it that <laughs> right um for pe people who are familiar with the uh classic adventure bottle demon um, mm -hmm. where, you know, you have, you know, the runner team and Blackwing and everyone hunting down this presumably, uh, earthed on <laughs> linked artifact that ended up like corrupting a dragon or something. Right, right. Um, but our leash was the great dragon who ends up getting involved in that mm, um, for okay. very similar reasons. That's interesting. I, I thought it was a, a name that I didn't recognize, um, but it's good to know that, that that's a place people can look yeah. to find out more. Yeah, we haven't um, we haven't really done very much with her in fourth or fifth ed, but she, um, she, she, she has some... Or she can make an appearance in Lethal Force for anybody who's read that adventure or interested in doing an adventure with a great dragon that's in it. Mm -hmm. Check that one out. Yeah, um, She does show up there, acting in this role of, of being curious about magical artifacts and playing almost the good dragon yeah. so, well i don't that's a yeah, well, that's like, a like, that's a rough yeah. question to, yeah, that keeping, might keeping, have to quite right keeping there. a young child's finger out of a light socket maybe but, yeah that's uh, <laughs> rough out there right yeah some other groups that are um interested in in hunting them down i mentioned these things so that you know one of the things we like to do when we talk about a book is give people reasons you know what can they use out of this and everything and and this is some info um to give you excuses to to use some of this stuff um the mm -hmm. the dark brotherhood and the order of saint sylvester are both um you know interested in hunting down and eliminating shadim i don't remember i i read this part a while ago i don't remember why the dark brotherhood is is so interested in that um in in getting rid of shadim but uh, i think it's kind of a a general like evil magic thing sure um they were first they were first shown in, I think, Street Magic from 4th Ed, um, but they were kind of uh, like Blood Magic Hunters as well. Oh, okay, um, okay. So I think, I think they're just branching out to like other magical nasties. Sure. Sure, there are other groups that are definitely just... A lot of these groups are just interested in getting rid of Shadim because, you know, like we said, everyone agrees that they're bad. Um, and, <laughs> so, and so let's do something about it. Like the Atlantean Foundation. Uh, the, the Atlantean Foundation's Mystic Crusaders are just, like, apparently super good at fighting Shadim. Like, particularly some of the best at it. Um, they hint in the book, nothing specific, but hint at a possible sort of ancient connection that the that Atlantis had to the Shadim. Um, so that could be another reason that they're uh, interested there. The Draco Foundation, apparently apparently Dunkel's on, saw them coming, the Shadim coming, and uh, so they have a particular interest in that, pr presumably for, for really reasons related to that. And the Astral Space Preservation Society, because, you know, the Shadim are doing weird things in astral space. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, they're often corrupting astral space too yeah. to be more like their auras, deathly auras. So they wanted a story. Yeah, yeah that whole you know anti-life thing is <laughs> yeah. kind of a deal breaker for most people. <laughs> um. Um. Right, right. Um, there are a lot of game mechanics things that have that the Shadim enter. In. I don't want to go into a lot of details there. If you want to know about it, there's some cool like creatures and critters and descriptions of how they appear in astral space, like astral jellyfish. That's such a cool like. I like that image in my head. How they're head. described, yeah. yeah. Whenever they get out of a body, yeah. <laughs> it adds some. It adds some neat stuff. It adds some stuff to buff up the little ones a bit because the normal Shadim are a little underwhelming sometimes. Which I don't know. They're supposed to be minions, like for zombies. They're yeah. When I was gonna throw, at a time. they're not meant to be big, but yeah. When I was gonna throw Shadim, or I did at the at these guys that Cassie was part of it, at the their actual play group. I seriously was like. 
why do I, why would I even bother with these regular Shadim unless they're going to be in like massive hordes or something? Because I did think that they were a little underwhelming. But like Cassie's mentioning, in Dark Terrors, there are a bunch of Shadim um, variants that are really interesting um, that you should mm -hmm. check out. Uh, like uh, one of them was like a big hulking bodyguard type Shadim that can just take so much damage, like, just can take tons and tons of hits and, like, really hard to kill, and it's just a regular yeah. sort of Shadim mm -hmm. variant. Yeah, I, I never mind there, them. there were, like, some shades of Left 4 Dead in there, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are, they essentially, yeah, now you got the supers, the special zombies. Yeah. Uh, I never meant, mind them too being too overwhelming, because I always think of the Shadim as tricksters, instead of being, like, upfront combatants or brawlers, they're usually gonna lie and trick to you into doing things, and they're gonna be cowards, they're gonna run away and lead you into a trap, you know? Yeah, I've heard you explain <laughs> it that way before, and it, it kind of did make sense to me, um, that, that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sneaky, they're trying to to affect things and don't necessarily want to well like in in one of the missions they put cortex bombs and a bunch of gangers and then run them at you and <laughs> the idea is when you kill them they blow up right they they do that kind of tricky stuff all the time and they what's tricky about that um, that's like normal uh, combat tactics right i know and in, in another one i think in uh in one of them they're spreading disease around in places so you you're wearing a respirator the whole time and they'll they're the goal is just to rip the respirator off your face so that you become infected and will die too. Like they tend to be more like that versus the big bads you're gonna go toe to toe with. Um, they're, they're dirty fighters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of um, more recent, speaking of uh, Shadowrun zombies, um, we one of the other things that this book addresses is uh, CFD. Um, cognitive fragmentation disorder and brooke we have here um actually uh did you write all of that stuff or just like yep that so entire chapter uh, cfd monads and uh the fall of neonet awesome so so remind everybody first remind everybody you know in you know see if you can beat cassie's two words um remind everybody what is CF cfd and uh to set the stage for what we're about to mention I don't think I can be two words, but I can get close. <laughs> um, nanite body snatchers. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's, kind of the, um, it's it's not quite you know like the gray goo nanopocalypse, but it's um, like digital intelligences like AIs and e ghosts downloaded into um, nanites that are able to overwrite people's brains. Yes, absolutely. So so they're really cool. They're often uh, thought of as kind of like a zombie thing as well um mm. but uh but more like the i think more of the boston lockdown ones are like like the zombie yeah type. The, sh the shamblers and ragers and lockdown were yeah. very much like that um yeah. Yeah. But uh, I actually very, very quickly skimmed this chapter because, again, I, I knew Brooke was going to be here and be able to tell us a lot about it. But f mm -hmm. what I saw from some of our notes and I was I was very excited to see is apparently there are cure. There's a cure for CFD now. Yes, um, there are several, actually. Um, the it's not they're not meant to be a. Um, you know, flip a switch and everything's back to the way it was. Um, but one of the Take main goals... Take this pill and call me in the morning. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, one of the main goals of this chapter that I discussed with Jason when I first started writing it was that we wanted to um, move the CFD plot so that instead of it focusing on CFD as this, like, monolithic extinction level event, sure. um, we wanted to make the story more about individual monads. Yeah, that's it. Well, that's really interesting because it did kind of feel like that's the way it was going. Like everybody was like, like it felt like, well, this is a thing that eventually everyone's going to have. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we at some point we, we fortunately realized that. And I remember right. seeing a, a, <laughs> actually a message on the freelancer uh, group ages ago. So I don't remember who it was, but somebody was like, so are we going to stop this before it turns into a, like the nanopocalypse or, <laughs> um, and I think that was when we all kind of realized, oh, we should probably really do something about this. Um, but yeah, so that was the, um, that was kind of the direction we were coming from. Originally, Jason had wanted to make it a more, more like managing CFD instead of, um, being able to cure it, right? Um, but also wanted to make it more accessible to players. Um, and my argument to him 
well, my two arguments to him were, first of all, anything that can manage CFD, realistically, if you apply it enough, it'll cure it. Um, and second, if we want to make it accessible to players, we need to have ways that characters can interact with CFD and not have it basically be a death sentence. That's a, and that's a really important point, I think, that you just made, because... Um, I've advised people before who are interested in the CFD stuff. I've said straight up, like, like if you're a GM, like, be nice. Don't, don't, like, you need to talk to your players ahead of time because if you give them CFD, like, this is a really big deal. But, but by giving it a cure, <laughs> and even though it's a difficult cure, um, giving them a cure means that as a GM, you, you, I feel like you, <laughs> like ethically have more, <laughs> a, more, uh, freedom to say, let me just throw this at my players and see if somebody gets infected and we can make this sort of like an arc that we follow in our campaign, you know? Yeah. And that was, that was, um, part of the motivation behind it too. Um, I was, <laughs> I, I have to admit, I was, um, I actually remember listening to the episode that you guys did on CFD a little while back. Yeah. Um, and I, I was kind of laughing at it because uh, a few days earlier, uh, we were still writing Dark Terrors, and I got a Facebook message from Scott Schletz going, can you send me your draft? I right. have to go on a podcast in three days. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, secrets out. <laughs> yeah. But I, um, I I admit, since you, you know described as you know, the least controversial plot point in Shadowrun, right. I, I was actually in the anti-CFD camp. Oh, um, yeah, really? For, for the longest time, I, um, a lot, and, and I can admit this now that it's published, um, a lot of the reason that I pitched the CFD chapter in the first place was because I wanted to make sure it actually did get sidelined instead of, <laughs> um, you know, dominating Shadowrun for the next two editions. And is that and why you weren't a fan? Everything. Because you thought it was just going to dominate yeah, everything? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it was. Um, yeah. And I think I, part of it is also I I probably get more attached to my characters than most people do. Um, so I know that other people won't be as um, won't be as concerned about that or, you know, would be more inclined to look at, like, the role-playing aspects of, you know, somebody being taken mm -hmm. over by CFD, um, but for me, uh, like, the idea of, you know, like, losing a character that I had invested so much time and energy in, um, especially, you know, if you if you play them to the point that they're actually getting involved in a CFD storyline, you probably put a decent amount of thought into it. Right. Um, and for me to have, um, to have a situation where it's like, well, if you get CFD, you might as well just re-roll. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that to me, that was like you know, if it if it had like a super difficult cure that you can make an entire campaign out of finding, that would be cool. But yeah, I think we went. Um, I think we went a little hard on the whole mysterious threat theme. Right, right, right. In the beginning and for the just because I mean, Shadowrun players, anybody who's familiar with the setting, it's not going to be easy to. Um, really shake them up with something like this because, like, we've seen the Shadim, we've seen, you know, Winter Night during the second crash, we've seen Bug Spirits. Right. Um, a mysterious, you know, potentially extinction level event isn't really anything new in Shadowrun. Sure, sure. Um, there aren't many settings that can say that, but. So it was I, I it was scary, though, had, because yeah. of the fact that um, it was, like you said, you know, almost a death sentence. And it came from things that it was like the things that you thought were making you better are suddenly, you know, <laughs> fighting against you. And so there was that like kind of scariness, but I, I think I agree with you. I think if you boil down most of the community's complaint with CFD, it really came down to um, either, either this is something that my GM is going to throw at me without my consent. And that's terrible. Or my GM won't do that. Therefore, it won't be a part of my campaign. Therefore, what yeah. what do I care about this? Um, yeah, there was no, there was no halfway point right. with CFD initially. You couldn't you couldn't like do a little bit of CFD. It was all or nothing. Right. Um. And so that so that was one of the things that I wanted to um to offset when I set out to write this. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's really good. I think that makes it accessible to campaigns. But so uh, some other things that happen about this chapter chapter are that we finally get uh, we finally get confirmation of what everybody who who knows and, and has been keeping up has been suspecting is that Neonet uh, they're they are going to be no more thanks to yes. uh, thanks to all this, right? Yes, I um, and that was actually I, I kind of um, had a little bit of a panic attack halfway through writing this chapter <laughs> when I realized that because I, I pitched it for the CFD angle and then I got through it, I, I got to writing the Neonet chapter and I was going, I'm killing one of the Big Ten. I can't screw this up. Right. <laughs> um, and that like that comment that Shadow Talk about Bull saying that you know it was like basically the first time since almost before he was born that Villiers hasn't had a corp on the corporate court. Yeah, and that's a really big um, thing. I was thinking when I read yeah, that, you know, that's like I I put that in because I realized that just as I was about to write it. Um, mm -hmm. And and that was just kind of my way of going. Oh my God, what have I got myself into? Um, right. So I I kind of feel like I should get an achievement for that or something. <laughs> unlocked um, achievement you know, unlocked kill, right yeah, now. Kill AAA, but, yeah, kill triple A. But but yeah. So the fallout of CFD um, finally, and this was actually helped um, the the players in the the Boston Lockdown uh, Shadowrun Online game um, helped decide this. There was a. Um, there was, I think, a poll done through the game um, between that oh. and Lockdown Book, um, where people, where uh, CGL took, uh, you know, a, a poll from the players saying, you know, who should be held responsible for this, um, based on one of the choices that you can make at the end of the adventure, the, at the end of the runs in Lockdown. Um, right. And it was overwhelmingly in favor of Neonet. Yeah. Because, um, you know... Richard Villiers has already killed two Mega Corps, so why not go for a third? <laughs> um, but yeah, so because of because of that, I went into that chapter going, okay, well, it's everybody knows that something's going to happen to Neonet. Um, it's just a matter of making it a little bit more interesting. Um, so my the, the way I went about doing that was less what happens to Neonet and more what happens to Richard Villiers. Right. Um, because if he had done, you know, what he had, if he had done with, you know, a fourth corp, what he had done with, you know, Novatech and Neonet, um, nothing would really have changed. Yeah, exactly. No, I like that you put sort of a, a personal face on the whole, on this part of the story, because... Um, personally, just speaking personally, I, I really love it when there are characters like like sure you can argue that the 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 Big Ten are characters in and of themselves, but but still like like putting like a person who speaks to us in you know Jack Point and stuff like that like and who's been around for a long time, gone between mm -hmm. corps and everything, just like putting yeah. a face on it is it kind of makes it gives it kind of like that. I don't know. It, it just makes it easier for me to connect with. Yeah, that was actually a big reason that I ended up using Miles Lanier as the um, the viewpoint character for that chapter. Um, right. When I when I pitched it to Jason, because part of it was you know he's like we've mostly seen him as you know a resource on you know CFD infections and things like that because he well technically still is but was actively. Um, infected by CFD up until that chapter, um, sure. but also because we're you know, talking about the end of Neonet, and Miles Lanier is probably the only person on Jack Point that can call Richard Billiers by his first name. Right, right. Um, and they and they have that, you know, by this point in the story, they have something like forty years of history together. Um, so if, if there was anybody who could, you know, give a, you know, a glimpse into what might actually be going through Richard Villiers' head right. during this whole thing, it would be Miles Lanier. Um, that also kind of came into play with that, um, uh, the, the DNO bar, um, keeping, like, keeping Villiers from being, you know, a CEO or a director on a major megacorp. That was partially to move him into the shadows and partially because... 
he's been around since the beginning of the setting, and we're trying to get some new faces in. Yeah. Um, so being being able to actually take him off the table as a major mega corporate player, I think is going to have more. Um, I think that's going to have more of an effect in some ways than Neonet being broken down and Spinrad Global stepping up. Right. 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 I th- I agree. I th- I've been um pleased with the way the way this is this is going. What else about um is there anything else uh, cures uh and neonet are obviously the big big stuff. What else uh, before we move on to um uh, a matrix related thing? Uh what else is is going on with CFD right now? Um well, I mean like you said, it's you know cures and neonet. Um mm-hmm. Boston is being rebuilt. Um, I was going for uh, kind of a like recently recaptured war zone feel. Um, so Boston is gradually going back to normal. Um, the worst hit places like MIT um, and T um, and the Fenway area downtown are still under quarantine, um, but things have been cleaned up enough that people are starting to move back into the cities and thus, you know, Shadowrunners able to work there again. Right. Um, the, with the CFD Cures, um, it's, I had intended to set it up in a way so that, um, with, in keeping with the whole shifting the story to individual monads, um, it gives opportunities for, um, you know, monads to be like runners or Johnsons um, or targets mm-hmm. of the run. Uh, I think one example, I don't remember if I mentioned it in the book, but I mentioned it to someone else separately, was, um, you know, let's say, you know, a monad who actually wants to leave their meat body um, hires the team to find a Technomancer with that new uh, Echo who's able to, to get them back into the Matrix. Right. Um, that's, I mean, that's just one example, but um, the whole, the biggest thing, well, the other biggest thing going on with the, the monads, and I, I, believe it or not, it kind of slipped my mind just because I don't really think of it in monads terms, it's right. more of an Evo thing, um, but Evo was relying really heavily on their, you know, mostly, well, not mostly monad workforce, but the, the monads within the workforce, sure. um, some of whom left with the uh, Gagarin base launch. Mm-hmm. So now Neonet's been milking, or Neonet Evo, pardon me, has been milking that for um, everything they could, and now time's up. So... So, so are, do, the, do they have people, like, do they have, they're just not there anymore? Um... Yeah, m- most of the most of the monads are have actually literally left the planet. Um, there was uh, right, right. Yeah, I remember that. I was, I was, uh, I was, I didn't know if the timeline had them. Ugh. I didn't know if the timeline had them already. I had forgotten that they. That December were... twenty seventy eight. That's right. They did it last year. Yep. Yeah. They well, yeah, <laughs> they <laughs> intended to do it last year, and then it. Um, it, it got. I, I think I said something about. I don't. I don't remember whether I said something about uh, late seventy eight or sometime in seventy nine. But right. that was one of, one of one of the other things I wanted to cover in the chapter. Right. When Jason and I were talking about, it, I went, "Look, we've been delaying this launch for two years. This is probably the well, maybe not the last, but this is probably going to be the last time for a while that we, you know, focus an entire chapter of a book on CFD. If we're going to launch this thing, we need to do it now." Or yeah. they'll never leave. Yeah, good point. Um, so. But um, related to related to uh, so cures and neonet are really kind of the big things. There's also some interest, mm. some parts. Uh, take a look at that stuff. Um, it's especially some technomancer stuff is is uh, related to that. But connected to sort of tangentially connected to this is um, there's some stuff in there about I kind of want to touch briefly on this because I want to get into something a little bit different. Um, but is uh, stuff stuff about the foundation. Cassie, you said you kind of jumped deep into that, right? Like the matrix and foundations. Yeah, they did some creepy stuff with foundations. They added some the null sect, which is some good big baddies for the matrix. Uh, they believe that non-emerged humans are the inheritor of the matrix. 
they are effectively work mechanically like AIs and similar, but they're definitely not necessarily that. So when you say non, non-emerged, you just mean non-technomancers? Yeah, the technomancers, the emerged. So they are gleefully trying to eliminate all AIs and technomancers. And so they make for good big baddies there. They consider AIs anomalies and they emerge to be interlopers. So they're trying to destroy them. The interesting part of them is that the overseers who kind of lead the null sect and the ice that are the, the bad guys of the, the, well, they're the goons, the goons of the null sect, mm-hmm. they can actually leave their hosts and chase down targets. Unlike, you know, AIs, which are usually isolated to some type of device. So they can move around a little bit, but they have some, some downsides so, if they so do that. So clarify for me, the because I didn't touch this chapter really at all, the Null Sect, mm-hmm. is this a mysterious force? The, like, what exactly is it? Is it a... Yeah, they're, they're a new source of entity in the Matrix that we're still learning all about, and they are very they against Presumably AIs. come from the Foundation? Maybe. Or, or we just don't <laughs> so know. We just don't know. Uh, what are the uh what? Brooke, do you have anything on this one? I don't actually. Yeah. I was very briefly involved in um <laughs> briefly involved in it right when we started writing it, but I oh. basically just said if you guys want me to, you know, mention this in the CFD chapter, I will, and then I right, never really right, heard right. anything back. So. Right. <laughs> Another thing of it is they talk about like wild hosts and things like that, which the uh, some of the AIs, uh, feral AIs live in. So there's kind of this big expanse of like this darker side of the matrix that we didn't know is there. And the null sect are these entities that are part of that. That's um, really interesting. Whether or not they come from the deep foundations, that seems like a good possibility. One of the coolest things they did for anyone who did foundations is the null node didn't do anything previously, <laughs> and it now has a use. Ooh, so you what? can actually use it to skim the other nodes and find their purpose. Oh, so... Oh, okay, great. So if you get to the null node, you can find out what the other, one, the other nodes are. Yeah, so it, it's kind of a nice one to find because it's the, the key on the map, right? So you can immediately know what everything else is. It's pretty sweet. That um, is really good. So, so that's some of the foundations of the the null sect. The people, the or the things that they are, are really interesting. They can't really communicate with anyone outside the matrix, and they're creepy-ish. So check them out if you're wanting to do some <laughs> big baddies in the matrix. <laughs> they're interesting, especially if you get yeah. a lot of technomancers around. I'm I'm um, interested in eventually learning more about the foundation. The it's it is mysterious to me, but I want to find out what it's all about. They're they're good fun. They're kind of the matrix. I mean, technically those are residence realms that are the matrix meta planes, but the foundations feels very similar. They're kind of a world that has certain rules and break other ones, and they're a little warped. So they're fun right. to go to. Right. Um. What about uh, so so shifting shifting uh direction a little bit um so dark terrors is all about like weird mysterious dark the dark things that lurk in the shadows of the sixth world that we were uh probably better off not learning about and one of them is uh (laughs) there's a whole big thing on um the uh the infected but in particular asmundo and ghouls right yeah, so there's some neat stuff that comes up for that. They talk a little bit even about how these different groups, like the 162s and all that, um, how infected work and how they may affect Asamundo. A great one in there that is terrifying for material, if you want to do a horror game, is the stuff on Tanimus. I don't think it's a lot of anything new. Everyone knows Tanimus is horrific and awful and some of the most despicable people for those who might For those world. who might not know, give them the brief uh, rundown. Uh, What's Tanimus? Tanimus is a syndicate of organ leggers, so they often deal in kidnapping people and slavery right. and okay. then they organ harvesting. But mm-hmm. and they're not just butchers. They are going to take you and grow organs and infuse you with generation regeneration so you regrow them and then they can take them back out again. Oh yeah. Uh, one that's of the a things they do real pleasant is the, stuff. <laughs> the seed operations, which is where they take women and they cut them down to just the parts you need to incubate a fetus. Oh, gross. And will actually breed children uh, with them. So, <laughs> so, so maybe maybe another one of those, you know, yeah, pretty so easy to. Yeah, so take out if you want. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. no good people yeah. with animus. 
Yeah, even even okay. in Shadowrun, there are a few unambiguous evils, and yeah. that's one of them. <laughs> and one of the, one of the interesting little things with Tanimus is, is Hannibal, the Jack Pointer, used to work for them. It's, she's a ghoul, and it's how she got her food, and she still gets scraps from them. Oh um, wow, I didn't know that about her. Yeah, and so the the one sixty twos as well are, tend to work a lot with Tanimus, but so do the sulfur rings and a, a good number of groups and human traffickers and stuff all will use Tanimus. I think Kane has worked with them a couple of times. That too. wouldn't surprise do, me. Yeah, do he's anything a lovely guy. For New Yen, but, <laughs> Definitely um... seen Kane um, doing that. So yeah, they're they're pretty awful. Uh, there's some other really interesting stuff that I'll just go real quick. Like the Atsim War had ghoul freedom fighters in it because they they're big in Amazonia. Um, as technology is hiring ghoul for combat purposes, Evo of course is very accommodating. Enough said. Um, right. Wu Sing was an interesting one. Uh, they are actually employing infected who have undergone magic or surgery to be passable, so if you use physical mask or something, so people don't know you're ghoul. I thought that was a neat one. They're actually doing a lot of astral research and stuff with ghouls. Oh yeah. And then, yeah, as a Mundo, the Ghoul Nation in West Africa, right? Like, that is sweet. Right. And that chapter is written really great between Red, who is escorting Traveler Jones. And so Traveler Jones is a non-infected going through this Ghoul Nation, and Red is an infected going through Right, it. right. And their two different perspectives are fantastic. It's some of my favorite writing in the whole book. Yeah, I need uh, to—that is another part of the book. I keep saying it. You guys are going to think I didn't read any of this book. Um, that's another part that I didn't <laughs> actually read because I knew Cassie was going to be covering it. But I— that description right there, I'm going to have to go back and read that part. Oh, it's it's definitely worth it. Uh, Red runs into some really interesting, like, moral problems that he still has. Because even though he's sure. been a vampire for a long time, you know, he he tries to hold himself to, like, that vampire code that some good vampires try to do, kind of, mm-hmm. quote-unquote. Uh, I was about to say, you, Cassie did air quotes. <laughs> good vampires. I did air quotes, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but as a Mundo, like, kind of, it's a ghoul nation and they just accept it. So it was a great scene where red realizes he has drank the blood of a child and oh, wow. it, it feels too good for him. And he's, he's trying to run to the bathroom to like get rid of it. Mm. Um, and then he's after that, he wanders back toward this place in like the kitchen and he, he looks in the kitchen. It looks all normal with whatever you'd find. And then he opens a door and he can hear the moaning of like three people who are more or less incapacitated with like feeding, you know, like, blood tubes coming out of them and it just runs straight into the bar right so a vampire just oh. walk up and they can wow. shoot you just like soda water here you go blood right. like... I remember I remember I, Kevin had a lot of well, maybe, I, I don't know if I can exactly call it fun um, but I know he was really he was really in really invested in writing that I was yeah. I actually just happened to be talking to him when, when he was writing that whole um, you know like red, red feeding on a child scene yeah I happened to be talking to him on facebook about something else and then he posted he said here just um like look at this uh, this part of the chapter that i was just working on and tell me what you think and i just read it and went holy crap right (laughs) so that's exactly the kind of thing we want to put in the book yeah 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 yeah, and it, it mentions a lot of different people who are going there, right? As Mundo's population has doubled in the last six years, and naturally this growth is also leading to food problems, which has long been their thing. And the corpse, some corpses are trying to help with that. And you know, some of the harvesting techniques that they're doing, the queen at first tried to work with her neighbors, like, hey, we'll trade you for labor. You just give us your dead, it'll be fine. But unfortunately, some packs of ghouls were like, we'd prefer to go hunting. Thanks. Uh, right. So, kind of hurts border relations. Here, but, yeah. Uh... <laughs> uh, so, they talk about like trying to make synthetics or making animal flesh that can, you know, do whatever they need to do to save food. And those attempts are not quite working yet. And then they have what you talk about, like the, the breeding programs and the stuff like Tanimus does, you know, where they're just kind of like, yeah, I mean, food, <laughs> food. food has been a, a, a big problem for Azamundo, right? So, yeah. So, um... so they, uh, they often have gotten some of their food through kind of, under the table means through Tanimus and stuff like that, and they've tried some legit ones, and like I said, but they yeah. still it well, is what it is. <laughs> I think part of the intent, not not necessarily from the writers, but part of the intent in the setting was um, that was mentioned in Dunkles on Will, um, just going back like way yeah. back in the setting, but right. um, there was there was that grant to anyone um, who could you know develop 
synthetic flesh that would actually you know, feed ghouls. Um, and nobody's managed to claim that yet. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's always a very off two of like, wait till the next war comes because they're talking about trying to fanfuse human elements into animals so they can just like eat animals but get what they need. And it's just mm -hmm. sort of leading to this thing of like, you ready for infected dogs? Right? Like, <laughs> we are just going to develop a strain. <clears throat> Something is going to go awry, as it always does, and we're going to have infected cats. Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is a movie oh. about that, I'm sure. Um, You're right. But uh, so the I bring up the Azamundo food problem because it kind of segues nicely into um, the next thing, which is um, some of the discussion about the elder gods in here so in a uh, forbidden arcana uh, we were introduced to the elder gods as sort of like a, um, a tradition that some mages follow and they're these cultists that follow these you know uh nobody really knows what the elder gods are they've been around forever before even the most ancient gods of greek and roman times you know and and who are they chaotic dangerous nobody knows um but there, uh, in in part of this story, there's uh, there's this whole big thing about a bunch of research that was found from the Ordo Maximus, right? And uh, and it's it's I won't go into all the details, but it's basically found and and suspected um, very strongly leans towards uh, implying that the Ordo Maximus, which is a if I remember correctly, they're a group of vampires, right? Um, they're no, just... well, they're they're a magical group of essentially old blood and rich people, titled people, barons, and stuff like that. Like they're they have an old history and lots of money, and at their and they're all awakened. And then at their heart, there's a, there's a few vampires. There may be a okay, few so, but vampires, but that's what it is. Like the okay, yeah, yeah, they're <laughs> they're, they're rotten core of the apples like vampires, Martin but they're natural enemy basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're vampires hiding in money, right? It's right. it's a perfect. So apparently they've got these these places where they do a bunch of research and like I said it's it's heavily implied that what the research that they're doing is research on the infected um ghouls but particularly the effects of ghoul cannibalism and it's again strongly implied that the reason they're doing this is they're trying to find out how does how are ghouls affected when they eat ghoul flesh because it again implied they don't out and out say this but implied that that um that they are preparing for when as a mundo uh basically collapses and then start having to cannibalize themselves because they ran out of food and what is going to happen when what are going to be the effects of that because and here's where the elder gods come in some of the research that they found is that when for whatever reason they had some groups of these guys they were they were feeding them ghoul flesh can uh you know ghouls feeding them ghoul flesh and to do research and they started to get some really mysterious um abilities some very elder godly kind of like they described it as like violet energy and that was able to make them do some pretty powerful and impossible things and so um a lot of people are really worried about what they're doing and 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 wondering are they trying to summon elder gods or do they even know what they're doing um who knows uh but uh there's a connection there mm -hmm. do you guys like the elder gods did at all i'm really fascinated by them i can't i'm having trouble getting into it really um, yeah. I've... <laughs> <This kind of laughs> goes back to, yeah. like, it kind of goes back to what I said before about um, like extinction level events not being new in Shadowrun. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. It's it's one of those things for me where and and even um, hearing some of the behind the scenes discussion, I don't have. Uh, well, <laughs> if I did, I wouldn't be able to say anything. But I don't have a solid answer at this point about. Um, how are we going to distinguish um, the Elder Gods from, you know, the Shadim and this resurgent Earth Dawn reference that seems to become, like, seems to have come back in force in uh, Forbidden Arcana? Um, right. I kind of, that's a really good point that you make about the, uh, you know, we don't dance around it here in the Sixth World podcast. We just call them uh, the horrors. The horrors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, so, uh, 
but I think why aren't they like why in my head in my head canon it feels like this elder god stuff and the horrors are like one and the same well you know? it should you, you'd yeah. think it would be um but we we already have this um this fairly well established canon with um as technology and the horrors that's um, true yes and so now we've got this other angle um, coming from the, I guess the, you know, the, the, the Lovecraftian tradition of horror, right, if you right, want right. to call it that. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know exactly how those two are linked. Yeah, I've gotten more and more into the Lovecraft stuff, which I used to never like it, but I'm super into it now, and I play all types of Lovecraft games, and I just don't care that they're in Shadowrun. So this, it's a hard part with me in some places in Shadowrun, but it seems like anytime there's a flavor of the week, they're like, let's add that in. I see right? what you're saying. So okay, like, that makes sense. Zombies are super big, get the Shadim. You know, like El Elder Gods, we haven't done that yet, get the Lovecraft crowd. Like, it seems... And I don't, I don't think that's fair, but some of the stuff, it just feels like... I like the horrors, because for whatever reason, I didn't really see them as Lovecraftian. As much as the Elder Gods, which just are straight up like when's Cthulhu? Well, up. that's yeah. clearly yeah. yeah. <laughs> like they, I think they even mention Cthulhu by name in Forbidden Arcana. <laughs> yeah. So it's like okay, that's it's pretty obvious what that's supposed to what that's supposed to connect to. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I I like it because I like the uh, but I've never exposed myself outside of to to this to this type of genre of of um you know. Elder God stuff, um, Lovecraftian stuff. I've never kind of delved into that, so maybe that's why it doesn't like, you know, tweak me um, in the wrong way. Uh, and I, I think it's a symptom a little bit for me. The reason I don't really like it is because it's that complaint where I, f I feel like the thing that ever made people like Shadowrun, like its niche, it's what it does. It's losing that, and it's now like we're just gonna grab everything we can and shove it in here. Or yeah, like before, yeah. and this is a common complaint of like that cyberpunk is disappearing and it's becoming too heavily a magic thing, right? And I just feel like it's we should it's um, losing what it was about. We right? should talk about that, <laughs> d delve on that a little bit more in the after party. I think that's a yeah. that's a good discussion to have um, because you've 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 talked around this type of topic before. Um, but uh, <laughs> the um, I, I don't mean that in a negative way. It sounded like I'm saying no, we're trying no, to no, avoid no. the topic. But, but uh, we still got we still got the biggest controversy I think in the whole book. Should right, right. right. So so let's let's go straight to that because the one thing that Cassie definitely wanted about bugs that she wanted to men talk about was uh, this is the big like a big big thing about bugs, right? So it's playable bug spirits were introduced in yeah, Dark Terrors. In the weirdest things I kind of quirk an eye about to begin with is because I'm pretty sure, at least in fourth and other editions, that free spirits could be playable, and free spirits are not playable in my, to my knowledge, in fifth edition. Why we jump straight to let's play bug spirits? I don't, I don't <laughs> get that one. <laughs> like, so I, I don't yeah. venture on to places like Reddit and stuff very much anymore, mostly because of time. Um, but uh, is I, you say it's a controversy. I assume that people are talking about it all over the place. I, I have no idea. Honestly, I've not looked it up. Oh, okay. But okay, I, I, I know people have mentioned before, like when Blood Magic became playable and the Shadim became playable in Forbidden Arcana and just that stuff keeps getting added in and no one likes it. And I know in all of those conversations... It's like there are things that people shouldn't be able to play, and Bug Spirits was always on that list. Yeah. And now <laughs> and we've gone, hey, look, out. let's play Bug Spirits. And, you know, um, go ahead, Brooke. I'm sorry. Uh, that was that was kind of the end of the thought. Sure, no, I, sure. I, yeah. I agree. It's this is one of those things that um, I, I know that I and I think I differ from other writers on this. Um, you know, particularly the people who wrote the chapter, um, right. but I. <laughs> It's it's not something that um, I'm trying to I'm trying to be careful how I say this because I don't I don't want it to come across as a knock to like anybody else in the Shadowrun team sure, or sure, this sure. particular playstyle, um, but I I agree it's one of those things that like you know the, there are certain things the player shouldn't be able to have, um, and in some cases that the players well with bug spirits for example apparently the players don't want. Um, yeah, I agree with you, and maybe we could maybe we could even uh, mention 
a little bit about this part of the discussion in the after party as well is 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 uh this to me it it uh brings up the issue of that i've started talking about more lately of of why are we giving people so many options um (laughs) (laughs) well yeah and i've recently got into that conversation in the emerald grid of like Man, we try to let everybody who's interested in playing anything, and we want to let players play a Bug Spirit. And I can't even imagine how you play a Bug Spirit, because the whole lore behind them is that, like, they're so alien to us, we don't understand their even process of thoughts, right? So the I've idea ne- of, like... So here's the thing. I've never... <laughs> I've never liked the... Any, any, any arguments and any discussions that end up talking about snowflakes or... or um, Oh, or, fair uh, enough. or like Mary Sue's or anything like that. That's not a Mary yeah. Sue. That's not what I'm trying to say. Snowflake characters, you know. So I've always yeah. said that, but I think this might be the first time that I start to think like, like that's you will if you have one of these in your campaign. I don't see how the campaign is not about that character, you know. Yeah, and I, and I could get an idea of a GM putting somebody in there just so at the end the 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 player can go, it was me. You know, like <laughs> and rips off their face and a mantis starts like, um, right. but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see like how it's, uh, and don't get me wrong. I definitely love like the idea of playing in an evil campaign and doing that stuff. So if you want to all make bug characters and buzz around sure, and try sure. to convert all of Seattle to being bugs, that's fair. But I don't feel like you even need rules for that. Right. You get out the normal well, even, position sphere stuff and just yeah, do it. Well, <laughs> even the book says like, uh, so by the way, it like gives a warning almost like these, uh, you're, you're if you make this character, it's going to throw everything off. So you might not want to do it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then that should have been like, the like, like, we just never mind yeah right right. right. so i feel like if you've got to do that like 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 i don't know it just it feels so so strange to me that i I think it sells books i think that's the only reason that stuff's really in there maybe i'm wrong there might be somebody who really passionately wants to play sure sure. everyone should i don't (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, caveat, we um, we are certain types of players, and everybody is yeah. has their own way of playing and having fun, so. Um. And yeah, and one thing I will say in defense of um, the writer's side of this is that it's, um, the, the part that I do agree with, even though I've been saying, you know, there are some things the players shouldn't have access to, um, the part of that that I do part of the more open philosophy that I do agree with is it's easy enough for people to just not use something. Right. And like, well, Um, like I said, there are going to be plenty of GMs that are going to go, no, you can't play a bug spirit. Um, Yeah. But for the number of people who do want to, then I would, I would be interesting to get that a poll to see where that is. Cause the number of people who probably want to do this, I bet is like this. And the amount of times the GM has to go through all of these books and be like, no, 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 no. Because yeah, yeah. I do that for 50 or more players on the Emerald Grid. And it gets exhausting, right, to constantly tell someone, no, no, no. And, like, I'm almost to that point of, like, if missions won't allow you to do it, then don't put that in there at some point. You know, if you, you won't let your player base do it, why are you giving that to everyone else's player base? Right, and th- and that discussion that you that you bring up, Brooke, is is actually what I was, what I think about a lot lately, and what I was. I think we should definitely talk about. I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna bring up immediately when we start the after party and we close the show here. But um, we are getting uh, close to time for the main part of the show, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this here. All right, guys. So there's a lot of stuff that we didn't talk about in Dark Terrors. You should definitely check it out. We hit the main points, uh, but um, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the stuff that I read. I'm going to go back and read that stuff about Azamundo. You really enticed me with Red and Traveler Jones, Cassie. (laughs) It's good. It's a really good chapter. Yeah. Um, Brooke, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about... Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. Um, I want to, if you have anything, do you have anything that you want to tell people about, like projects you're working on, maybe not even related to Shadowrun or stuff, Shadowrun stuff that's coming up that you're working on that you want people, you want to plug? Um, well, we've got 
uh, I believe Jason's already, Jason and others have already announced well, Street Lethal, obviously, Better Than Bad, the Hooters book, mm-hmm. is going to be coming out after Street Lethal. That's the one that I've been working on most recently, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, yeah. Because that's another angle of Shadowrun that uh, we haven't seen before, and I know it's been discussed on this podcast, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, early on in the whole where have all the heroes in Shadowrun gone yeah we had a whole episode about that you're right mm-hmm. so and that's um, obviously you know Op- Opti is heavily involved in that yeah no um, doubt to the surprise <laughs> yeah. of nobody um, but yeah that's I'd say especially after writing Dark Terrors it was really nice to have that change of pace of going, yeah I yeah there is actually some good in the sixth world yeah um, but yeah Street Lethal and it's better than bad but I think both going to be really interesting for people yeah, so definitely keep an eye out for those. Cassie, do you have anything that you want to plug before we go? Uh, Emerald Grid Twitch channel. Come watch us out. We're playing Curse of Straws on Wednesday, which is with an amazing GM who has set a beautiful horror scene. Check all of that out. And then I run Storm King Thunder on Mondays, and we play Shadowrun. That's kind of the thing we normally do. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, myself, uh, guys, we just ran this really fun one-shot thing on Twitch. It was uh, we. It was called A Cure for Equestria. It was a My Little Pony t- uh, Tales of Equestria uh, tabletop RPG run that we did. It was really, really fun. And if you weren't able to go, because I mentioned it last time, if you weren't able to be there live, um, it is on YouTube now on the Shadowcasters Network YouTube channel. So you should go out there. Uh, just go to YouTube and search Shadowcasters Network um, and subscribe because I keep having to say go to YouTube and search because we don't have our custom URL yet because we need more subscribers. Um, <laughs> but um, the uh, so go in there. It's called A Cure for Equestria. Uh, it was really fun, really fun. Uh, Mr. Johnson from the Arcology Podcast is on there. Super good. He played a forgetful adventurer pony. Um, <laughs> it was a uh, and there were plenty of other people there too. Um, lots of fun. But um, that's it for the episode. If you want to contact us, and like I said, those listening live, we're about to hang out for the after party and talk about, get into some of this uh, uh, stuff that we we had to to cut short for the episode here. But uh, if you want to contact us on the show, you can tweet at us at 6 World Podcast, the number 6 World Podcast. Email us at the show at 6 worldpodcast.com. Our website is 6 worldpodcast.com. Our outro music, which you're about to hear, is by Johnny Nuclear and the Meltdowns. Our logo artwork is by David McDermott. You can find him on sixthworlddesigns.tumblr.com. From me and from Cassie and from Brooke, thank you for watching and bye bye. Say goodbye, guys. Bye. When the days have gone dark and the sky's turning gray, everybody in the world, they're just staying enslaved. The technology's machines, we just feast for the screen, lost in reality. I'm piecing your dreams. Society sodomized by the lies and the greed. That's right, we're back.